Hi everyone, uh, my name is Professor Michael Anderson uh, and I'm the co-director uh, with Professor Emerita Robin Ewing uh, of the CREATE Centre. Uh, before we talk about the CREATE Centre and we get uh, to this magnificent uh, webinar, I just want to acknowledge country and I'd encourage you also to acknowledge country from wherever, wherever you are, whatever First Nations people uh, are associated with the land that you're on. I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which uh, we meet here today or where this, um, where the University of Sydney at least can't, uh, is, is situated, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Uh, it's on their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney was built and the CREATE Centre uh, is situated. Um, and I'd also uh, like to acknowledge that Aboriginal land was taken, and it was stolen and it was never, never ceded. And we, we live in attention because of that. Thanks very much for joining us today. Um, I just want to uh, tell you a little bit about the CREATE Centre. As I mentioned earlier, my name's Michael Anderson and I co-direct the CREATE Centre with Professor Emerita Robin Ewing. The CREATE Centre has been set up actually as a place where education, well-being, health, uh, arts and creativity have a home. It's, it's so people who are interested in how uh, the arts and creativity can intersect uh, and interact with, with health, well-being, education, all of those places, uh, it's so we've got a home, we've got a place to go to. And it's, it's also been set up to connect uh, people, people in uh, arts organisations, people in mental health settings, people in schools, uh, people in prisons, people in all sorts of places, uh, bringing them together so that they uh, can research, learn from each other uh, and teach each other about some of the wonderful things that are going on uh, in the arts and education uh, and creativity. Now, today, uh, we've got a fantastic opportunity to do just that. Uh, to learn about the Shakespeare Reloaded project, to understand how it's been working. And um, we've got a fantastic panel that you're going to hear from today. But without speaking too much more, uh, and I'm reminded also that if you want to join Create, sorry, I, I forgot to say that, uh, Thomas DeAngelis will drop a, uh, a link uh, in the chat. Nobody um, needs to pay a cent to join CREATE. It's, it's open and available to anyone. And we'd love to have you as a member if you're not a member already. But I am going to uh, hand over to uh, Liam Semler, who is the Professor of Early Modern Literature and somebody who has been such a force in connecting schools and education with Jackie and the rest of the team. Uh, and Liam, let us know about uh, what's going to happen today. Very excited. Great. Thanks so much, Michael. Thanks for your introduction and uh, your acknowledgement of the country. It's great to be here and to uh, be presenting. Uh, there'll be four of us from the Better Strangers or Shakespeare Reloaded team presenting, but I uh, can also see um, another member or two who are also uh, attending. We'll be four people presenting 15 minutes each, which will take us to five o'clock or so, and then we'll have 15 minutes for question and answer time. So do please uh, think about how you might want to engage with what we're presenting. It's going to be a whirlwind tour of what the project does. And uh, we'd love to get to some of the questions at the end, or if they're really uh, on topic right on the to at the moment, we might be able to respond uh, as we go along, but you should be able to feed uh, your questions into the chat as we go. So I'll get started by uh, sharing uh, my screen. <clears throat> okay, well, the uh, project, sorry, is between Barker College in Sydney and the University of Sydney. Barker College is a K to 12 school or even before uh, K, I think, <laughs> and uh, with the University of Sydney. And it's, that's the primary partnership that began as a linkage project in 2008. Since that time, project members have moved to other universities. So we have strong connection with Australian National University and James Cook University. So there are three universities involved in the project and one school, and that makes it a fairly tight partnership, but also gives it a high degree of stability. 
there's the project team. It's varied a little bit over time, but uh, it's been quite consistent really over the years that we have been running. You'll see there are eight members of the team. Okay, so uh, there's the team and I'll keep moving on. All right, what I wanted to uh, begin with by was by indicating the trigger for the project. And the trigger was academics, uh, including me, having a look at the situation that we're in, in the teaching of our discipline of English. So that might be literary studies at university and at school, we're thinking of uh, English. And in both cases, the subjects have a fair bit of overlap, but they also differ from each other. You can see here, I've represented subject English as a boat that we're all in, and it's a boat that we recognize now is governed by some key factors, which include an increasing focus on the self. Students explore how their selves relate to uh, the subject of English. They explore English in the present, very much an emphasis on the present context of studying literature. They are conscious of the market, the marketplace that structures the discipline. And there's a gradual decline and transformation in reading and what reading might actually be. And these are key things that subject English is dealing with. As a boat, uh, it is also influenced by AI ed. And that's the turbulence which is coming uh, at the front of the boat and will transform education. It is already, but it will significantly transform education as we move forwards. You can see there on the main sail of the boat, the acronym WWTIFH, which means we will take it from here. And so that's really the key, uh, a, a key interest between education and artificial intelligence. Who will be in charge of the boat? Will it be companies providing educational packages and artificial intelligence algorithms and that sort of thing? Will they be driving the boat? So the question for us is where does that leave the teacher? To what degree is the teacher influencing the discipline and what happens on the boat, especially as AI ed grows in power? Beneath the boat, you'll see that the whole subject is floating uh, on something that we've called cis ed. And this is the project's term for the educational structures that contain institutional learning around the world and these structures it's widely acknowledged are increasingly focused on measurement and control and audit systems so how much room to move has a teacher got and in what ways can we renovate or rejuvenate teaching when it's increasingly troubled and controlled and our project was a response to that the way we responded was by having a think about a different approach. And that different approach is complexity theory. Complexity theory works against the whole notion of cis ed, which when you think of cis ed as an overly structured educational system, that's the current situation that teachers are in, particularly in Australia, where there are so many aspects of administration and compliance and audit that are managing what they do within and beyond the classroom. Complexity theory was one way to get beyond this because complexity theory introduces us to a systems view of organizations and of change. And for us, that means how can our project think about educational organization and teaching and learning because teaching and learning are about change. And the way we think about it is through a complexity theory lens where we think of education and human interaction as a complex adaptive system. And complex systems are lively, they're open, they're driven by complex local and multi-level interactivity. They're not simple. They're, uh, they're not fully controlled processes. Uh, they're not chaotic though. They're not utterly random. So complex adaptive systems are instead fertile and they're processes that function at the edge of chaos, not in chaos, at the edge of chaos or far from equilibrium. 
And so they're a mixture of linear and nonlinear processes and they are sensitive to positive and negative feedback uh, and a number of other factors that relate to complexity theory. The main thing is the final point. We hope that by creating a teaching and learning project that embraces uh, interactivity uh, at numerous levels and embraces the possibility of uh, unexpected change and interconnections that we can see the emergence of new ideas that are not predicted and that are not um, set up in advance. So complexity theory stands against in many ways what might be best practice in some educational spaces where things are overstructured and outcomes are overdetermined in advance. And so we set up the Shakespeare Reloaded project as a complex system. We set it up having in 2008 to 10, when it first um, commenced, it had three primary components, an academic in residence program. This is the black writing where we would have an academic on the school site, teaching teachers, having workshops, working with students. We also ran units of study from our master's program at the University of Sydney, but we ran them on site at the school at Barker College. We had travel fellowships where a teacher and an academic could travel together and learn about Shakespeare and share what they were learning. We worked on developing a website and we co-hosted a conference in 2010. The aim of all that is written there in the red. We wanted to generate positive turbulence by having these loosely connected aspects of the project. And we thought of the project as a cluster of five innovation communities and teachers could opt into one or more of these groups and learn about Shakespeare in different ways. But it's all about connectivity. So they would be sharing what they're learning, whether they're involved in the travel fellowships or the conference or developing a website or whatever it might be. And by sharing all these ideas, our aim was to put stress on the systems that contain uh, education and teachers in the hope that those systems would not be able to contain the fresh ideas that might emerge. And we didn't know what they were, but we are banking on the emergence of fresh approaches to teaching and learning. <clears throat> and so we had a term for the opposite of CIS-ED. So if CIS-ED is the overly structured educational system that you find, uh, which is a highly managerialist form of education, we wanted people, teachers, academics, to exit their usual workplace and go into the forest of Arden. And so that's a term we've taken from Shakespeare's play, As You Like It, in the forest of Arden, transformation can occur to characters in extremely unexpected ways. And so we think now of Arden spaces. The project was an Arden space when we created it, a space where people could go to expect the unexpected and fresh ideas. And the principles of the partnership were that it was built from the ground up and built around connectivity and diversity. And the problems that we've encountered are ongoing problems for teacher and university partnerships particularly the lack of time within a busy school, uh, fatigue within uh, team members and also within the teaching community because of the burdens that they're under. And just the question of how the university and the school interact with each other, the institutional interface. So there's a summary of how the project looks. It's funded as a linkage project partnership originally between Sydney University and Barker College. And that funding produces these five innovation communities that are all loosely coupled with each other and fresh ideas come from that uh, complex system, all that interactivity of teachers and students and those ideas feed back into the university and the school. So in 2008, the project commences and it's a project which is a research and teaching project. And the current slide is simply to indicate that. If you look down the left side, you'll see that we have an array of activities, educational activities. They, they vary a fair bit. The Bard Blitz in 2009 
is about how to write an essay without an essay question. The Shakespeare Imaginarium in 2013. Uh, my colleague Jackie Manuel will talk more about Imaginaria shortly. One activity that I'll jump to in a second is Shakespeare Redrawn from 2020. But in the second column, I just want to point out that for every activity, we have publications either published or forthcoming because we're, we want to explain and annotate and demonstrate how these activities relate to complexity theory, but also just to educational innovation. Shakespeare Redrawn, that was our 2020 lockdown activity where we weekly released a novel quote from a Shakespeare play and urged people to draw a picture in response to it. Uh, one of my favorites there is the middle one. I think this be the most villainous house in all London Road for fleas. And you can see that there that the, the seven year old picture actually drew the house on the back of a flea. The point about Shakespeare redrawn uh, was that it encouraged people who were locked down with their families once a week to engage with the Shakespeare text uh, for parents to sit with their kids and let them draw something in response to a Shakespeare quote. And then we would share that on our social media platform. So the website didn't launch till 2014. That's important because it took us six years to get the website uh, ready to go. We thought we'd do it in the first three years in the 2008 to 10 space when the first when the project was first funded. But uh, we had to learn how to create a website. We had to learn what was good content. And we finally arrived at the, the website that we wanted in 2014. In 2010, the initial funding finished for the project. But since that time, the partnership between the school and the university is so good that we've had a series of rolling three year research agreements. And those agreements are what maintain the project up until the present. Along the way, we've run conferences and road shows where we visit different uh, places in Australia. Uh, the conference is there, Future Ed conference from 2019. Well, there's a conference uh, at Oxford Brooks University we ran in 2012 and road shows to regional centres like Townsville in far north Queensland. We're going to Canberra in the Australian Capital Territory later this year. When we do a road show, our team members connect with the local English Teachers Association and we get teachers together and we run workshops uh, with them. Finally, a quick glance at some books from team members. We have more recent book projects underway at the moment. And I'll conclude just with a very quick snapshot of what emergence might look like in a project like that. Remember, I said that by having these interacting parts where everybody's learning different things and sharing their ideas about Shakespeare, we hope that new ideas will emerge from it. And this is just a diagram showing that one teacher, Lucy, uh, at the school, she joined the project in 2008 when we launched it and she commenced a Master of Arts degree because it was easy to do through the project. And she completed that degree in 2012. But along the way, she talked to a doctoral student on the project and got ideas for redesigning a year seven module at the school called Weird Words and Bloody Battles. And then in 2012, she went on a travel fellowship with the project where we visited houses in Stratford-upon-Avon and she came back inspired by that and redesigned her year seven module. Then in 2013, she collaborated with another teacher at the school to renovate their year eight program. And so you can see the ripples of the project going beyond Lucy to other teachers in the school. And then in 2015, she was enriching her teaching of Macbeth by ideas that she got from the master's course that she did that we taught on site at the school. And in 2018, students were still referring to that, uh, that Macbeth teaching as, as really impactful. So I'll finish up there and hand over to uh, my friend Andrew Hood, who is the school lead of the project. Thanks, Liam. <clears throat> uh, welcome, everyone. So I'm the head of English at Barker. I've been involved in the project for 
um, the whole 12 years, but uh, as head of English in the last 10. And I thought what might interest um, people out there after Liam's fantastic um, theoretical um, framing of the whole project is just how a school would see it and whether that would be a kind of a highly worthwhile model that could continue. In some ways, I think at Barker, we've, we've lived with the project for 12 years uh, and it's um, been something we've almost taken for granted, but I, I think it's probably unique, uh, certainly extremely distinctive uh, in, in Australian English, in Australian education to have such a long lasting uh, project that's been, I think, so rich and deep. And so what I wanted to talk about today is just, just the way that I think the school has approached it, the teachers, uh, and the students have have gained from it. And therefore, I think it, it is quite a unique and distinctive um, experience and, and where we're supporting and hopefully the model might um, grow across Australia. So I'm pretty bad at this, but I'm gonna try and share my screen. Um, is that coming out? Uh, what have I done? Uh, oops, so have I lost a case? Um, you ask, can you see that? Is, is I can't. So, so is if I is that the next is that the next screen? Can people That's see that? Good. Yes. Yep. That. Okay. Yep. yep. Okay. So, um, the first thing I wanted to look at was um, just a teacher school student perspective. So, this one here: Why has Barker sort of enthusiastically supported the project for over a decade, and what's kind of creative about it. And I thought, well, looking up creative, it's using the imagination or original ideas to build something new. And I think that's definitely been what it has been um, for Barker. It's been a really strong, powerful uh, project for the English department and given us a sense of identity, a sense of purpose uh, that, that has been truly wonderful. So um, if you look from the school perspective, um, some of the strengths of it cre creatively, I think have been the ongoing nature of the relationship. So the fact that uh, it, it's lasted and we've been able to um, keep keep being part of this project for each three year cycle ha has really meant, I think, a sense of security, a kind of a sense of, of, of open-endedness that we can do all sorts of things. And that's part of, I think, what Liam's just said about the creativity. Um, I think it's brought, which, which, which the team has brought is a sense of um, the kind of theoretical side as well. So we, we too, at the secondary level, just like at the tertiary level, I think are fighting systems education. The fact that I think sadly enough, despite all the insights of the project, systems education has only probably got worse in the last decade. And we felt more and more sort of constrained. So the art and spaces that the project create are actually a, a, a wonderful thing and a really powerful thing. Um, and, and I think what it has done has provided a real sense of, um, uh, vision. So one of the things that Jackie will talk more about, but I think one of the absolute strengths of the project has been the Imaginariums, which are sort of three to four nights in a cycle, one, you know, one Tuesday night each week. And we've met on a, on a key part of topics led by the uh, academic and then the, the teachers and, and sometimes students have, have taken part. And I think that project, that, that part of the project has been one of the most wonderful elements of it, because I think it's it's lifted the vision of staff. It's really developed and built their, their sort of understanding of, of Shakespeare, of poetry, or of writing in ways that are just kind of extraordinary. And I think through the lens of complexity and through the lens of systems education and fighting against it, it it's been a real time of refreshment and new vision and uh, enjoyment. So I, I, I think from a secondary point of view, um, just having an ongoing connection with the university is one thing, but I think the depth, the breadth, the quality of, of the thinking that's gone behind it and the kind of outputs that have occurred have just been quite extraordinary. And that, that's been a, a large part of, of the strength of it. Um, so it's not just, you know, PL sessions or professional learning sessions every so often. It's a kind of feeling of belonging and feeling of being a part of it. And I think it's a model that, again, could be transferred to other settings and, and develop and enrich a school enormously. I think also it's been a highly targeted project. So each year we at our school end have, uh, have also targeted elements that we would like to, to talk about or see and, and, and discuss with, with the team and the team's taken that on board and built that into 
the kind of output or projects that we've got. So we've we've had some incredible presentations on Coleridge by Will Christie, who I can see in front of me. Hi, Will. Um, we've had incredible presentations from Jackie, from Liam, um, from Claire, from Kate, um, the whole team, Lauren too, sorry, Lauren, fantastic one on dystopia just the other night. Um, and I think in, in all cases, it, it's kind of addressed points of need, but it's also been part of a larger, bigger, uh, richer project. And, and I think we've benefited enormously from that. So, and I think the relationships are part of it as well. So the, the secondary team here, and it's turned over a little bit in the last few years, but before that was fairly stable, have built up, I think really strong, deep, trusting relationships. And that's made the Imaginariums, the various presentations, the various experiences just so much stronger and richer and deeper. Um, and I think with that as well, again, uh, for, for Barker, what it's created is a sense of we can also go via email or in person or via phone to get answers on a whole series of English and other questions. And again, I think relationship is so much a part of that. One of the biggest things in New South Wales education, one of the strongest things in English is extension two. And extension two where they write uh, a long extended either critical response, 5,000 word essay, or write a 6,000 word short story. It is a whole year project where they have to do a whole lot of research at a reasonably high level. And again, connection with uh, really switched on, really clever, um, Academics has, has been an absolute part of our success here. And we, we have been nominated as a sort of a center of excellence for extension too. And I think, I think a sizable part of that is our connection with the team and the, the way that's gone. So, you know, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. Um, it's, it's also introduced, I think, broader perspectives. So six of us have done the Master of Arts. Um, and, and for a lot of us, that was one of the richest times of our lives. And I mean that, it, it was a tremendous sort of experience. And again, I think, uh, it encouraged a number of people to go on to to um, sort of higher learning that they would not have otherwise done. So, you know, it, it is, I think, a really powerful and Im impressive model. And I think also a very talented and diverse team that you saw earlier. The fact that it's a team, I think, plays into all the various strengths that the team have in, in early uh, modern literature, in romantic literature, in secondary education, in English education. Uh, all, all of those strengths, I think, have been something that have been wonderful for us, powerful, enriching, but I think something that could, um, could be transferable. And therefore I think is an original contribution to education. And, you know, it's, it's something that I think, I think it was an amazing start back in 2008. And I think it's gone on to be uh, incredibly powerful and, and, and ongoing. Um, there's also, I think, creative benefits um, for teachers. So, um, th these are these are part of the things that we've gained enormously from uh, from tailored professional learning. So uh, a number of visits a term or a year, as well as the Imaginariums, which Jackie will talk more about. Um, kind of asking a whole series of various sort of smaller research questions at the school and working them through with Liam or Claire or um, Lauren or Jackie or Kate ha have been fantastic. The various games that have been there. Um, I think we've developed our departmental library, and that's not something to actually under, you know, to, to play down. I think being exposed to, a, I think, a wider range of theoretical and uh, critical work has been a tremendous strength of Barker's, and I think that's that's been part of the project. Uh, as I said, tips on extension two projects and ideas, where to research, what to look at, and I think even with that, even even informal tips as to other members of university staffs that we could access and talk to has been tremendous. So I think the interface between secondary and tertiary education has been an absolute strength of the project. And I think, again, a model that hopefully could be transferred in a whole lot of different ways, notwithstanding that the theoretical background and style might be quite different. Um, there has been exposure to um, conferences, to overseas travel, to master's degrees, um, to the ability to co-present. And even recently, I've had the chance to co-write with Liam uh, a really fantastic chapter on the whole project. So again, I think it's, it's opened up this school, uh, secondary teachers here to a whole series of opportunities that just wouldn't be the case. And, and, and the depth and knowledge, I think of our kind of Shakespeare program, our poetry program, our writing program would, would not be nearly as um, strong. Um, a number of students have gone to the Shakespeare website and so have the um, staff and used a number of those games and those ideas and they've been uh, very fruitful as well. 
Um, and I think a lot of it has been the way of thinking. Uh, it, it's just been a, a really invigorating and powerful project. So the sense of belonging, the sense of enjoyment have been wonderful. Um, I, th I think there have been incredibly creative benefits for students. So again, a very reproducible model, I would hope, you know, even though I don't see many other sort of school and tertiary education um, areas being, being part of this, but certainly I, I would spruik the benefits of Better Strangers enormously. Uh, we had uh, lecture presentations on just about every, well, on every uh, Shakespeare text that we do, uh, an, a number multiple times. We've been exposed to the latest scholarship um, from Jackie, from Liam, from Will, uh, from Kate, from Lauren, from Claire. Um, I, I think it's broadened the understanding of the staff on what constitutes a good response and, and how to construct it. We've played most of the Shakespeare games that are on the website and they've been fantastic. I, I think the idea of, of Shakespeare serendipity, which I struggle to pronounce, is always um, a great idea of rubbing different ideas together and uh, again, massively um, creative. And I think you'll see that uh, as Jackie uh, talks about it. And I think um, just, just I, I think what the students have benefited most of, apart from a number of activities that we've run with the students, is just their teachers being more informed, more aware, uh, more educated. So I think it's been tremendously beneficial in that regard. And then finally, we, we've, we've tried all along for it to be of enormous benefit for the English community and the tertiary community as well. So for every Imaginarium we've ever done, we've always invited other English colleges, uh, English co colleagues across systems, across states, across territories. We're, we've had an Imaginarium for a, lower, a set of lower SES schools uh, in the west of Sydney. And the idea has been that while we, this particular school has benefited enormously, the, the goal has been to, to give back to the community. And that's certainly what um, the team has also tried to do and I think has done really well. And the tertiary conferences, I think have been the same. I think they've been a chance to, to sponsor and build and grow a kind of a broader, deeper understanding of Shakespeare and, and build that connection between secondary and tertiary educators. So each of the conferences that we've been part of there have been that mix of, of tertiary and secondary education, which has been fantastic. Uh, I think the website as well has spread the message far and wide and the various academic books and articles. So the idea of the project, I think, is that it benefits this school. It does benefit the teachers at this school. It does benefit the students at this school. But I think it does reach out really widely to the community and has made a lasting and powerful impression. So that, that is what I wanted to communicate this afternoon, just, just the sort of contribution that we felt and, and therefore that I think would, would be lovely if this kind of project was more widely um, shared. So I'll hand over to Jackie now. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, everybody. I'll just share my screen now. We're getting quite good at this. Um, so um, thanks for the opportunity to talk with you about this uh, uh, amazing project. I came into the Better Strangers project team in 2014. Um, I'm actually not housed in the English department as all of the other team members are. Um, I'm involved in, in um, a teacher education in our education um, school in the university. So my main remit is to prepare English teachers um, and uh, for that reason, this project has been so incredibly valuable, not just for me, but also for those pre-service teachers. Um, as Liam and, and Andrew mentioned, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Imaginarium because that really is, is like a centrepiece of the project. Um, and I thought we could, I'll take my face off the screen. Um, I thought, um, you'd be interested in seeing how that works in practice. So I'll give a practical example um, after looking at the principles of the Imaginaria, which were developed by Liam um, quite a few years ago. If you're in education, if you're a teacher, uh, you're very familiar with the models of professional learning that we're now experiencing. Um, those models are generally uh, professional learning is a one shot kind of almost like a, an inoculation. Let's, let's make sure you know about this latest policy or let's make sure you've got some strategies to teach this particular text. Um, 
they rarely foreground the processes involved in the collaborative generation of knowledge. And I think that's one of the hallmarks of this model of professional learning is that we intentionally um, push towards that collaborative generation of knowledge, which means, why is that not working? Sorry, this is doing strange things. Um, so the current models are infrequently teacher designed and teacher led. Often um, teachers are required to sign up to outsourced professional learning courses, which they don't really have any say uh, in terms of the design and in terms of the focus. And there's something strange going on here. So please forgive me for being um, faltering here. Um, they're also typically regulated ex externally and they tend to undervalue or ignore teachers' context, the context in which they're teaching, in which they're living, in which they're working with their students. Um, and often they're how-to, they're you know, training in policy, training in curriculum reforms, and what Wilson and Byrne call subsistence strategies and techniques. Well, we kind of wanted to shift away from that model. And that's where the Imaginarium emerged from. And we, we think of it as a social democratic model of professional learning. And this is referring to Sachs's notion of the democratic professional. So in other words, it's not just based on ticking boxes that performative ideology whereby you have to have a certain number of professional learning hours per year so you can tick that box um, in your uh, accreditation portal. Um, we're interested in the ways in which, as Andrew ha has uh, indicated so very well, that we, we can have that secondary and tertiary interface so that there is the collaborative decision making and teacher agency becomes a central part of what's driving the professional learning. It's not a top-down model. Um, it's it's non-hierarchical in that sense. Um, and it seeks to problematize our current pedagogy. It seeks to provoke in the way that Liam mentioned at the very beginning, a kind of productive disruption, if you like. Um, and it's inquiry based. So at the core of all of the professional learning uh, uh, events is, is that research base that we um, tap into. But we also importantly seek to harness that intertwined personal and professional narrative of teachers. Um, so often the teaching self, the person in the teacher um, is effaced um, or at least ignored and marginalised by the kinds of packaged professional learning uh, that now seem to dominate the, um, the landscape. So that's a sort of snapshot of the, the philosophy, the underpinning kind of motivation for, for this kind of approach to professional learning. And there are five principles that govern the Imaginaria. The first is to stimulate fresh thinking not just about the subject, but about the self as teacher and to get a sense of the bigger picture of teaching and learning rather than focusing always on the micro how to subsist. Um, yes, it's based on consideration of re recent research, but we want an open minded and collaborative discussion between professionals. The second is to be aware of the professional constraints. Clearly, um, these are imposed by the specific curricula, by syllabuses, set texts. Yes, we acknowledge those and we're aware of them, but we don't want to be constrained by those constraints. We want to work within, but also um, move into the Arden spaces that are, that are quite distinctive from those constraints. To include professionals from differing institutions, and Andrew has, has touched upon that, um, sharing diverse experiences and expertise beyond the boundaries of our normal um, workplace, which can become um, um, quite hermeneutic um, often because we simply don't have time to reach out and connect with others in, in diverse workplaces. To have a governing theme and some structure 
but be actively open to the unpredicted emergence of novel ideas that may arise from the collaborative experience and the process itself. So it's not about, in, in Liam's words, um, having predetermined outcomes. It's about the process of collaborating, exploring ideas and trusting that that will actually generate new ideas, which has been the case. And then to value the imagination and creativity uh, in all teaching and learning and to pursue creativity, not forgetting systems, but pursuing creativity in intentional ways um, in an effort to perhaps disrupt, but also to um, be able to navigate those, those systems without losing our passion and losing our motivation to teach. That, um, that's a very brief snapshot of the Imaginaria over the, the 2013 to 2016 period. There have been Imaginaria since then, but that gives you a sense of the variety of focus areas, topics, um, and the kinds of people involved. But I want to focus on an example um, of an Imaginaria, and this is the Teaching and Learning Caskets Imaginarium. Uh, and already those of you who know you Shakespeare might have already twigged that uh, this Imaginarium is inspired by the Caskets Challenge in The Merchant of Venice. So teachers are faced with various choices in teaching and learning every day, every minute of every day, they're making decisions um, about how to respond to particular situations. And when any choice is made about how to teach, there are ramifications. So we might say following the play's ominous promises in respect to the gold, silver and lead caskets, that a teacher might get what she or he desires, get as much as he or she deserves, hazard all she or he has got. So the Prince of Morocco, you'll recall, famously asked, how shall I know if I do choose the right? So that question underpins this model of, of the Imaginarium in that the same kind of um, decision-making processes apply to us in every facet of our work as, as educators. Um, so, the process involved in this Imaginarium is that we have the metaphorical caskets and they deliver value in a single container. So what we have is one hour where we get together, we have one topic, we have one scholarly reading associated with that, and then we have what's called a jewel. I'll explain a little more um, now. So two two-hour workshops, two caskets open per workshop and an hour spent exploring each casket's content. The discussions are governed by three succinct considerations. So what, how and why? What are we discussing? Apply the topic that we're discussing and justify it. Why would we be interested in this? So here's an example of one of the teaching and learning caskets Imaginarium. So this one, we had three, well, we actually had four caskets, but I'll, I'll give you an overview of three of them. The first topic was slow education. Um, and uh, that jumps out at you immediately as being quite a provocation in terms of a topic, because who amongst us has the time to be slow uh, in our work or in education more broadly? So there's a reading there. And there's also the jewel, which is a poem by Wordsworth. In each case, we've, we've identified a jewel as being a literary text or an excerpt from a literary text because we're working with English teachers and English educators, it seemed appropriate. Um, it's also a, re a creative representation of the kind of topic or theme um, that we're focusing on in that casket. The second casket in this Imaginarium was uh, empathic intelligence, looking at the emotions in teaching, which again is another uh, almost invisible dimension of teachers' work. What Hargraves talks about the, the emotional labour of teaching, um, others have looked at this 
in some detail, but it, it really gets a run um, when we're, we're talking about teachers' work. It's unacknowledged often because um, teachers are required to be eternally resilient. And if they're not resilient, then it's a problem for them as an individual rather than a problem for the system as a whole. Um, so our reading there, thinking about feeling, and then our jewel was Anne Hathaway by Carol Ann Duffy, which um, certainly sat very nicely within that focus of empathic intelligence. Then the third was a thing-centred pedagogy, and this really did stir up some, um, some robust and vibrant conversation uh, with our group. Um, and then the jewel here was um, an excerpt from The Tempest. So that gives you a sense of, of the notion of a casket, what's in a casket, and how we actually use that to stimulate and also generate the kinds of um, knowledge creation. Um, and, and I suppose that kind of challenging of our own taken for granted assumptions about what we do as educators. And, and just to give you some um, a sense of, of teachers' responses to this, this kind of seminar setting to engage with ideas is a highly unusual form. Don't stop, more please. I certainly like the more meaningful consideration of philosophy that underpins what we do as classroom teachers. I like the breadth of topic, not too confined by just teaching oriented articles. In the frenzy of the school year, it's amazing how two extra hours of thinking can actually be refreshing. It was great. And then um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, consistently, that's the feedback from teachers that, they, that kind of gives them a, a recharge, if you like, for, for that period of time. It sustains their motivation, their enthusiasm, their passion, even when um, even when life as a teacher seems to be incredibly overwhelming. This is almost um, uh, the Arden space for us to gather as colleagues um, and refresh our spirits, um, if you like. So I'll hand over now to Lauren, who will uh, look at the website. But I also wanted to say that on the website, the Imaginarium as a model and the examples of um, the models that we have run, they're all there for you to take up in your own um, context, to adapt. It's all freely available. So if you're interested in, in following up on it, please jump on the website and have a look. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen and I'll, I'm gonna do kind of like a demo of um, some of the activities that are available on our website. So can everybody see my screen okay? Yeah, okay. Okay, great. So this is, I'm gonna start with Shakespeare, which is I think um, fair to say are probably our most popular activity on the Shakespeare Reloaded website. Um, so you can easily find us at shakespeareloaded.edu.au. And then you can see that there's this tab up here at the top. Um, and if you want to you know, go on our site, that, that would be wonderful and just kind of um, have a play around. There's a ton of information on the website itself that I won't be able to, to cover in full. Um, I might just flag that um, we have um, a bunch of different activities available here. Shakespeare is just one. And then we have a theory tab as well that has um, all these different uh, t um, pages that are de dedicated to these different types of educational or literary theory. Um, and so you can find information about those things there as well. Um, oh yeah, thank you, Jackie, for putting the, the website link in the chat. That's great. We, we also have a blog. So maybe just quickly before I go to Shakespeare, I'll click on the blog as well. Um, so the blog has a bunch of um, you know, qu quite diverse publications on it. Um, sometimes we just publish um, uh, kind of newsletters about what we've been doing, um, updates on our events and things that we've been running. And then there's also um, information about our publications um, each year. And then um, we also have articles actually that we write and publish in the blog format. Um, so maybe just as an example, 
so this is a student at James Cook University, a student of one of our team members, Claire Hansen, um, wrote a guest blog post about um, this Othello production that was uh, put on by Theatre Inc. In, in Far North Queensland. And then um, I've written a couple of blog posts about using um, the nostalgia of the 1990s to teach um, Shakespeare and using some of those Shakespeare films from the 90s. Um, so that's just an example of some of the things on our blog. Okay, so I'll go back to Shakespeare now. Okay, so um, here's, this is just a kind of, you know, description of what the game is about. It's, it's a fast-paced gamified learning experience um, suitable for high school students, university students, or teacher professional development. I have used this activity with um, like advanced mature age students because I also teach at the Workers Educational Association in Sydney and um, I had one of my students was in his 90s and you know loved the <laughs> love Shakespeare so I would say that it's not limited to you know what we would consider to be traditional learners you can use it definitely um, in lots of diverse ways okay so I'll, I'll kind of demo how to use it so this is our Othello Shakespeare so um, depending on how your classroom is set up or how you're using it, you can totally use this on in a Zoom format too online by doing screen sharing. So um, there are three, six, nine cards in total. There's a wild card and a tame card. And the wild card is usually a um, resource that is, uh, you know, might perhaps seem un unrelated to um, the Shakespeare play that's being explored. And then the tame card is the easiest to understand. But I realize that I'm, I'm, it might not be clear what I'm actually talking about. So I'll just, so I'll flip the cards. You can, so you click flip card. So let's, let's flip three cards. Okay. And then um, you, you get this kind of preview of each card. And Shakespeare is uh, devoted to video resources. So, so behind each card is a video resource that we have deemed related to the play and that, um, you know, we think will generate kind of fresh conversation and interest in the play itself. Um, and, and you can kind of game the game as well. So you don't necessarily have to play it in the way that we set up or that we explain on our site. Um, you can kind of use the resources at your own will and decide how you want to use them. Um, Okay, but so we flipped th these three cards. You could potentially, you know, break students up into groups. Um, so let's say you had three groups of students. Maybe um, each each group is, uh, you know, responsible for um, watching each each video, and then they have to kind of come back all together as a class and um, discuss collaboratively what they think their videos were about, and then you could watch them all together as a class, or you could just access one item. So then I click access this item. Here we go. Okay, and then it takes you to this page where you can play the clip directly. Um, I, won't, I won't play the clip just because um, it seems like my, my internet's a bit slow, but, um, and you can play the clip and um, you can, and then you click, okay, back to cards. And then you can um, continue with the other videos that you've chosen or you can pick another card. So you can only pick four cards at a time. That's an important feature of the game. So this is the team card. So I'll just click access this item. And you can see how this one is, you know, maybe a bit more obviously related to Othello because it's a clip from um, a national theater production. Okay, so I realized that the time is kind of, we're a bit um, low on time. So I'll move to the next activity. So an older version of Shakespeare, so if Shakespeare is the resource or the teaching activity that's dedicated to um, uh, that kind of complexity theory approach to teaching and learning in the classroom, like in the form of a resource, and it uses videos, Shakespeare and Dippity was the kind of earlier version of that. And um, Shakespeare and Dippity has some um, more diverse resources in terms of their modality. So you can get um, same card format, but you can access resources that have to do with video. So here's a video resource, um, another video resource, and then um, here's some text. So Shakespeare is purely video resources, whereas Shakespeare and Dippity, you know, can pair some video resources with text. Um, 
And yeah, here's another text as well. So this is, is a review. And this, this card brings you to all these different reviews about um, Richard III. So that's, that's Shakespeare and Dippity. And that Shakespeare and Dippity is different to Shakespeare in that Shakespeare, you can, you can run the, the activity in real time in your classroom or wherever you're running it on Zoom in whatever way you want to. And it can kind of just go in that time frame. But Shakespeare and Dippity, because there's text involved, might require just a little bit more time. So if you wanted to run the activity over a two day period, um, you know, that's one way that you could do it as well. And we have instructions on the site for how you could um, do that. And then I can't see at the moment. Okay, here it is. So here you can see that you can email your selection. So, you know, these are the four cards that have been selected so I can email them to myself to you know refer to okay so then the next thing that i wanted to flag is our um conference so this is another um kind of example of our uh collaborative output and our um the way that we kind of see the project as a space for um people from lots of diverse educational landscapes to come together and how you know we, the project kind of sees itself as a way of facilitating that um, collaborative uh, work between teachers between um, academics and also theater practitioners so i saw that i think joanna erskine is here in the um in the in the presentation which is wonderful hi joanna so um uh, from Bell Shakespeare. So um, Bell Shakespeare was involved in the um, Shakespeare Future Ed Conference and Joanna was one of our keynote speakers. So um, from, from Bell Education. So that's kind of an example of, of um, how the space was, you know, not just for like straightforward educators, like people who are teachers in schools and universities, but also people who are educating in um, more, like creative capacities outside of traditional um, educational uh, institutions like Bell Shakespeare, for example. Okay, so I, maybe I'll play. How are we going for time, Thomas? Because I know that um, <laughs> we, we want to have time for the Q&A. You've um, got a little bit more time. Um, okay. I think everyone is, everyone's as riveted as I am. I think we're happy for you to go on a little bit longer. And then um, maybe at about 10 past, we'll um, start questions. Okay, that's great. Okay, thank you for that. So I'll play this video. We have this really swish video that <laughs> um, kind of sums up the, the conference and um, has some testimonials and, you know, you can kind of get a sense of the event. So it was from um, uh, the 1st of February to the 2nd of February and um, it was run out of the University of Sydney and um, we had a really diverse number of attendees. Um, like I, like I mentioned. So yeah, I'll just kind of play the, the video and let it do its thing. Okay, just, can everybody see that okay? Yeah, okay, good. I'm Liam Semler. I'm a professor of early modern literature at the University of Sydney. And uh, we've got on the Shakespeare Future Ed Conference, which is just a fantastic opportunity to bring together researchers, academics, practitioners, primary school teachers, school teachers um, from different areas. I'm attending today because I'm a new teacher. I'm an early career teacher teaching both drama and English. So I thought that the Shakespeare is of course cross-curricular for me and I just wanted to boost my professional learning in that area. Yeah, Shakespeare should be something today, so don't grow King Lear and hunt with a weight. He is working up analysis and post inspection and his plans have things that have a connection to today all over the past. So don't disregard because you don't know it's fun. The conference to me is a great opportunity to, for me to learn from you all, or as we would say in Texas, y'all, and to connect with other teachers who teach Shakespeare plays in these complicated political times and to have an idea to the future, not just reverence uh, for the past, given the focus of our digital age. People here have been really commenting on how fantastic it is where you can have school teachers talking to practitioners or academics and everybody sharing uh, ideas. So it's really about building a, a louder conversation, more diverse conversation about education. The workshops especially, you get to do a lot of interactive things. So you're up and out of your seat, you're learning techniques that you can use in the classroom. So that's great. 
You don't kind of get a chance to do things like this in your everyday teaching life, so this is a good opportunity to meet new people and meet new ideas as well. Sometimes in classrooms when you do things out of the box, it can be a, a lonely experience. A lot of teachers are very reluctant to do anything different, but uh, it's kind of confirmation that I'm on the right track, that other teachers are doing it, we're going along with the crazy, and kids are getting some great things out of it. Education is changing rapidly. Classrooms are changing, the way we teach is changing, and the time is right. And the number of people that have come along uh, over these two days has just been incredible. The interest is right now in, in Shakespeare and education. Okay. Okay, great. So I'm just going to change um, the nature of what I'm sharing. Oh yeah, so this is just some participant feedback about Chick Serendipity um, and how teachers use it. And um, I think the thing, the, the, the key thing to keep in mind, particularly with, with resources like Chick Serendipity and Shakespeare, is that you can kind of game the game. And so you can kind of tailor it to your own, you know, unique approach in the classroom or, you know, wherever it is that you're using it. And that is a key focus of the project that it also, um, you know, really foregrounds teacher agency and um, cre their creativity as well. And I think that really speaks to some of the things that Jackie was um, pointing out about the kind of history of professional learning and um, how it can often be a be a top down approach. And that's that's really the opposite of what our project is about. And so, you know, we we really um, make sure that the resources that we produce are um, usable for teachers in ways that they can decide how they want to use them. Um, so that's just, yeah, some of the feedback. And then that was from the conference. Oh yeah, we, have, we do have social media. So um, it would be great if people who are, um, have wonderfully joined us, if you wanted to follow us on Twitter, we, um, we do post things on Twitter pretty regularly. And we have a Facebook page as well, but Twitter is definitely where we are the most active. Um, and if you want to tweet us or ask us questions or just get in contact with us in general, the Twitter page is a great place to do that. Um, the Shakespeare redrawn activity that Liam um, was pointing out earlier in his uh, section of the presentation, that we ran fully on Twitter first. So we kind of piloted that on Twitter and then we um, published the kind of results of that on our site. Um, and that was during that kind of early lockdown period of, of COVID. So um, we had we had people connecting with us there and sending us their, um, um, oh, Liam's on Twitter now. Okay, great. <laughs> um, yeah, and kind of sending us, you know, their um, pictures of what their, their kids were drawing at that time. So that's a great place to get in touch with us. Um, maybe I'll just spend the last minute talking about so so my role I don't know if I said anything about what my role in the project has been but I've been the research assistant um, and the doctoral student as part of the project since 2017 I think Liam or maybe 2018 I can't the, the Liam has supervised me um, I did I did a master of English studies in the department of English and Liam supervised um, my master's project and then I started my PhD in 2017 and I very recently submitted it um, but I'll just talk very briefly about kind of what my PhD was about, um, because it definitely emerged, to use that complexity theory term, it definitely emerged from my um, relationship with the project. And, you know, I was very lucky to be co-supervised by Liam and um, Jackie, who are, you know, I'm sure everybody has gotten a sense by now, you know, like leaders in this field. So I was very, very lucky to have them. Um, you know, guiding me through the whole process. But my, like, part of the title of my PhD is, is reading the curriculum. That's the kind of, that's the short title of the, <laughs> of the longer, the longer title that I won't bore you with. But, um, and really what I wanted my PhD to do was to bridge the gap that is an identified gap in the research between the methodologies of literary studies and um, how English is often approached in school contexts and how often literary studies doesn't necessarily speak across to what 
um, education is looking at in terms of English. So that was kind of the goal of my project was to um, speak across that divide and offer um, an example of how you can be interested in both education and literary studies equally. And um, one of the things that I did was I used literary critical approaches like close reading to approach educational issues, particularly in treating um, curricular documents as literary texts, meaning that, you know, just reading them in a really kind of fine grained way and unpacking them and thinking about how they might have, um, you know, that they're making arguments basically and thinking about them um, in relation to the literature that they are prescribing and how the literature that is being prescribed on the curriculum can actually speak back to what the, what the curriculum says about it. Um, that was a big focus of my PhD, particularly um, in relation to empathy. So the, the project had a kind of historical, rhetorical and literary scope, um, all to do with how empathy and the teaching of literature are connected. And I was really able to do that, you know, by drawing on Liam's theory of sysed that I think he unveiled earlier, um, and Jackie's work, you know, years of work on the history of the curriculum in New South Wales. Um, and that was kind of how I was able to build my, my own approach in my project. So, yeah, I wouldn't have been able to do that without, you know, being involved um, on the team. And yeah, very it was a great experience. So yeah, okay. <laughs> I think that that's enough for me, but thanks everybody. Well, I think we might have the Q&A now, which I think um, Liam is as kindly um, volunteered to moderate. Um, and I think we've got a question. We've just got some wonderful thanks there from Mark Byron, but perhaps if anyone had any questions, thanks, Mark. they might um, like to either post them in the chat, uh, chat room or unmute themselves and just ask um, directly the Shakespeare related team. Yep, and I think uh, I think Jackie may be moderating it. Um. Yes, I am moderating it, but we don't have any questions there at the moment. Thank you, Mark. Um, thanks very much for being here. Um, we don't have any questions. I've got a question, so... Jackie. Yes, Mark. Yeah, I've got a question. Sorry, I thought, uh, I, as I was uh, looking at the amazing work that Shakespeare Reloaded's done over so many years. I had had two questions really. The first question is, and you've kind of, um, Andrew kind of answered this a little, but how do you sustain such a long lasting relationship uh, in a context where things are shifting constantly? So, you know, the demands of having to make um, justifications uh, to see school executive, et cetera, et cetera. How, how does that happen from the university side and from the, um, from the school side? And the second question is, and this might be a question to you, Jackie, uh, if you move outside the principles of uh, Shakespeare education or the context of Shakespeare education, is it possible to, to fit the concepts of um, complexity theory, some of the principles in the Imaginarium to teacher education and education generally. Mm. It seems to me that Shakespeare is kind of a, a, a learning context, but you could talk about this in the context of, you know, anything in English and potentially mm. anything in the curriculum. Mm. So just interested in thoughts in uh, both of those ideas. Mm. Thanks, Michael. Um, well, you're absolutely right about the adaptability of that, that model. Um, I certainly use it in teacher education with my English students and I've, I've, I've um, applied a, a, a kind of teaching and learning imaginarium, but have done so um, within the context of it could be, for example, approaches to teaching poetry or um, non-pedagogical aspects of becoming a teacher. So yes, yeah, certainly that's really enriched my pedagogy in the initial teacher education context. And um, we, we certainly do apply that model to um, topics outside of Shakespeare. So our most recent Imaginarium was the uh, looking at writing, looking at teaching writing. So it had a a far broader kind of focus. Uh, 
does that answer the question? Um, it could be it could be applied more broadly to initial teacher education, yes. But I think in in the master of teaching, for example, we we're already using that inquiry based model. So we're we're mm. already picking up on a number of those principles in the imaginarias. Um, so and we tend to really push that notion of democratic professionalism in the way that uh, we approach our, our M teach in the foundations and, and curriculum units. Mm. Um, mm. So there's a, there's a lot of, there are a lot of parallels. There's a, a strong alignment there philosophically and pedagogically um, uh, with the imaginary model, but it's just a wonderful kind of um, a, a wonderful way that teachers in their own context can take the resources, say from the website, um, and implement those in their own way, in their own school context, if they wanted to. Yeah, no, that's um, great. That's hey, Mark, good Michael, yeah. I might um, <clears throat> add a footnote to that as well. Um, it, you're dead right when you mention, you know, how do you say apply for grant funding or that sort of thing, or how do you maintain a project when partly the project is claiming that it doesn't know what it's going toward. <laughs> We know what we're doing, but we don't want to over determine where we'll end up. And that is certainly a challenge when you're asking for money. And I've got to say, uh, really, the, the, the backing that we've got in this partnership from Andrew and Barker College really helps that work because that's a high degree of trust where we're all committed to this. But what makes it work particularly, I think, is that we see each other as professionals with a lot of skills. And so uh, whether you're a school teacher or an academic, and so there's a big trust in the profession. We know that we can do things and we believe in the educational professions. And, and so we're prepared to back ourselves and back each other. And then it's just a matter of trying to convince uh, funding bodies additionally uh, about that. But, but it's a great start to be believers in the expertise that we have. And, and I think that's really important going forwards where expertise is questioned so often. Exactly. And, and Michael, you asked about how, how was the partnership sustained? And I'm sure that, that others in the team will, will be able to speak to this. But, but for me, um, uh, part, I mean, at the core of it are the relationships. And we've been very fortunate that we've had stability in the team members in terms of the the university and the school-based partners so as andrew mentioned he's been um, head of english now for 10 years and um, over that time you do develop that deep kind of trust i mean it it may not have been the case if um if any any team member weren't the um, the kind of personality that they are, it may not have worked. It, it's just, it, it's serendipitous almost to be able to bring together a group of people who, who just gel in terms of personality, in terms of their way of seeing the world. Um, and that kind of collaborative, genuine um, collaboration has been a, a real standout for me. I, I don't experience that anywhere else in my professional life. Um, I've, I've just noticed uh, Katrina Spadaro's comments in the mm. chat. Interested to hear more about the institutional interface, challenges or opportunities between the two systems. The two systems was really the trigger for the whole project back in 2007 when we were um, creating the idea. We were aware of the fact that there are two systems, the secondary and the tertiary, and we needed to get them interacting more if we could. And uh, there's a research paper written by Shauna Coleman and myself, which is on the website under our research tab which talks about school university partnerships and, and that addresses exactly the challenges and opportunities. But I can say uh, from the school side and the university side, but one way to sum it up might be to say that school teachers are very pragmatic and academics problematize everything. And if you can get those two sides working well together, 
then it's a compromise for both, but the results are fantastic because it helps the academics think in practical terms outside more theoretical and abstruse spaces. And it helps the school teachers reach more into a research space. So pragmatics and problematics, getting those to work together has been really one of the most fascinating aspects of the project for, for my, my money. Uh, and another thing in terms of challenges, definitely timing. How do you get these different uh, academic calendars to work together? Teachers are very busy and they're overloaded in various ways. How do you get a project that inherently feels exciting to actually be exciting and refreshing? How do you make it refreshing when teachers uh, might just desperately need some time off rather than something that could be perceived as more professional learning? So that's a challenge that one has to negotiate that there's not much available time and how can you make this a pleasurable, uplifting experience, not just more learning? And uh, Andrew's superb catering. I, I think that's a major draw card. <laughs> Agreed? <laughs> <laughs> well, that what, that's what gets me there every time anyway. I'm joking, of course. But that's an important part of it. It's, it's part of that, that kind of social... Um, uh, ambience that we try to generate. It's not just about the professional dimensions, it's also about the, the, the people um, uh, who are there, not just as teachers, but as human beings. Okay, well, it looks like we may have come to the end of our uh, questions and presentation. Uh, so I think I'd like to uh, sincerely thank the CREATE Centre for facilitating this presentation. It's been an excellent opportunity to have a number of team members talk about the project from their particular perspectives. And we really appreciate those people who've joined to listen and have a think about what we're saying. We're very keen to chat at any time about the project. So we're, get in touch with us, uh, have a look at the website, have a look at us on, on Twitter and uh, Facebook, and we'd love to interact with, uh, with you more. So that's probably about it then. It might be time to uh, call, it, call it an end to the show for today. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank and thanks, Michael and Thomas, Thank you, very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, team. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.